for dedication. Uh, call your attention to 2 Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians. You've heard this before, too. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians, you've heard this before. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7 through 10. Verse 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 through 10. I'm flirting with this idea. Why you look for that? Why you go on your phone? I'm flirting with this idea. I got to share it with you. I'm flirting with this idea to do a sermon series on emotions. And Jamel, I want to call the series Pick Up Your Feelings. <laughs> um, so I don't know when I'm going to get it started. I don't know when I'm going to start this up, but I, I think that's where I'm leading. And I think this was kind of like a segue to inspire that. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. Here's what it says in the New International Version. It says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelation, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses and my in the insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Mm. To keep me from becoming conceited, because of surpassingly great revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I want to talk from this idea, this thought today. When it is what it is. When it is <laughs> what it is. I was listening to two people talking the other day, um, and they were talking about a problem that one of them was having. They were talking about a situation that one of the young ladies was having with somebody in their lives and what they were thinking about doing about it. And the other person, her girlfriend, her homie, or whatever, said to her, girl, if he causing you that much stress, you need to do like I do my hair every summer, cut it off. And they did the, okay, <laughs> you know, they did the, okay. They kept talking about how to get rid of people and to cut people out of their lives. And I must admit, it got me to thinking in that moment. When we uh, get caught up and we are watching these self-help shows and we're listening to personalities on talk shows give their pop psychology or we are on social media, every other phrase seems to be an encouragement or a slogan to get rid of people to shift dead weight, to cut people loose, that every friend you are a friend ain't a friend to you, that sometimes you got to cut people out of your life to grow, be careful of the people who cheer you on too much because they might be trying to take your spot. Uh, all of the statements that make these comments and philosophies about getting rid of people in your life. Now understand, I'm not saying that those ideas are altogether wrong. That's not what I'm saying. And, and I myself have taught and preached and um, mentioned some of those on the right instances. What grabbed me is that now it seems that we're talking more about removing people in our lives. And we're not talking about what it means to work with people in our lives. It says a few things about the society we live in. One, it suggests that we are less and less likely to deal with people that we have challenges with. And it's better to make them a non-issue. It's better to remove them, to actually engage right, in substantial dialogue and interaction. 
And two, it suggests that life is supposed to be about what we want. It suggests that life is supposed to be about what we like and what we deal with and what's easy for us. And I don't have to tell you, all you need to do is just keep on living and you will understand that life is not always easy. Life is not always about what we want just because we want it. Here's the thing. What if, what if, and this might sound scary, what if life isn't supposed to be easy? What if there's some things that we are supposed to work through? Some things we're supposed to deal with. Some problems that we just have to face. Why we are busy in our culture talking about how to cut people out of our lives if they make things difficult. But if we can't cut them out, what happens? What if we can't just remove something because we want to? What if we just can't go? What if we just can't leave? What if we can't just shift? What if we can't just move on or give up or give it up or replace it? What happens when a situation is what it is and we have no other choice? I know that's not what we've been conditioned to believe in this day and age, but sometimes we don't get what we want. Sometimes we just don't get what we want. I heard that prophet, that great prophet, Dwayne Wayne from a different world. He said on an episode one time, they were talking about prayer and a, a relationship with God. He said to Freddie one time, sometimes we get what we want. Sometimes we get what we need. And sometimes we get what we get. In this cancel culture, we have falsely convinced ourselves that the issue is somebody else's. That the decision is ultimately ours. And that the issue is just a matter of geography and willpower. However, we come to understand that we can't always get away from what we don't like so easily. We come to learn that things don't happen just because we want to cancel them. And if we're not careful, it can cause us to blame ourselves, blame our conditions, and even blame God for where we are if we're not dealing with it. God shows us, however, that it's not about what you have or where you are or what you're dealing with as, a, as much as it's about how we approach the situation. Sure, life will have moments that will be difficult, and life will have moments that we'll rather not choose to deal with. But when it is what it is, God still has ways of revealing to us that there is a different kind of strength in those moments. That God reveals to us that our power is not what we can remove, but the power is that we allow and trust God to help us to what we can endure. Life will bring us all kinds of things that would, we could choose to cut out or we could choose to walk away from or simply not deal with. But when we are forced to live with certain things, God can show us that, things, that we can still find strength even if it is what it is. Journey with me in this text real quick and let's wrestle with this thing for a minute. This very familiar text, I know that you've heard it before, but understand when it is what it is, we always have a desire to first look at the turnaround. We always want to turn around and how this goes. Paul is sharing in this particular text of the church of Corinth in this second letter. He, the reason he's writing this second letter is he's talking about the blessings that he's experienced from God's spirit. He's doing this because the first letter to Corinth was met with some objectors. It was met with some haters. Paul sent a letter to help the church in Corinth, and some of the people there said, don't listen to Paul. He don't know what he's talking about. And so Paul sends a second letter to make himself clear as he set the detractors straight. Paul, in the beginning of this letter, tells them that he is full of the spirit, although the haters have told the people Paul is full of something else. They say, don't listen to Paul. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. Paul has not had relationship like the other apostles. He did not walk with Jesus like the others did. Paul is not genuine in what he is doing. But Paul makes this argument that he is full of the spirit and what God has shown him is as valid and it is necessary and it is relevant as anything else. Even though he's an apostle of a different nature, he did, he did not walk with Jesus when he was on earth, but Jesus has come to him in many revelation and Paul says he has seen visions of heaven. 
Paul tells and explains that these visions look like what they are. He's quite descriptive and he sh as he, as what they've been shown. And he says, I'm not doing this to boast, he says, but to ensure that those who are challenging his authority, that he is indeed connected to the Holy Spirit. He says, I've seen the third heaven. I'm not bragging, but the truth is God is connected to me and there's something working in me even if you don't receive it, believe it or not. Paul says, I can boast if I wanted to, but that's not the point of all this. The point of all this is to let you know that God is working with me and God got his hand on me. Paul, uh, But Paul says in the leading verse of the, that leads up to verse 7, he says, to keep me to, from becoming conceited because of these surprisingly great revelations, there is given me a thorn in my flesh. Stop right there. See, we often want to run to the thorn without understanding what the thorn is doing. It says right here, it says, to keep me from becoming conceited. Because of these surprisingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. Some of y'all still ain't getting it. Paul says, I'm connected to the Holy Spirit in a very unique way. I've got the power and working with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been chosen to witness to the people and to evangelize to them so that they might come to know the gospel. I have seen Jesus on the Damascus Road and the Lord himself has blinded me and given me an assignment when he opened my eyes. And I've been blessed to see visions. People got healed with the shadow of my presence and I can describe in detail what the heavenly host look like. That's a lot of responsibility. That's a lot of gift given to one person. That's a lot of ability and talent that's been placed up in me. But to keep me from getting caught up in myself, to keep me from thinking I was all of that, to keep me to thinking about it too long, in fact, I can think it was all about me and the blessings I have. I've been given a thorn in my flesh. To keep me from thinking that it was about me, God sticks me every now and then. Oh yeah, to keep me from thinking too much of myself, God got me working with this thorn. Uh, are y'all getting this? Paul has a thorn, a struggling that he deals with even when he's given so much to work with, even when he's given all of the gifts and all of the abilities. Paul is gifted. He is blessed. He is appointed. He does have an assignment, but Paul is not perfect. Paul is given a thorn that he's got to contend with. Can I make this thing live? If Paul didn't have the thorn, he could possibly concentrate more on the vision more than what's happening in reality. Reality. Some of y'all missed it. Paul might focus more on the gift than the challenges that are going on around him. If Paul didn't have the thorn, Paul might not see our problems like his problems. If Paul didn't concentrate and know that he had the thorn, Paul might go around thinking the point of his assignment is to tell people how much better he was than they were and about the vision and not about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If Paul didn't have the thorn, he might start thinking that God was thinking that he was more special and better than everybody else and everybody was just an imperfect being. So Paul has to deal with some humanity to understand that even though he's gifted, he's still wrestling with the realities of life. Can I help some of y'all in here? Don't think that just because you got a thorn to deal with that you aren't gifted or that you aren't blessed or that somehow God doesn't love you or that God is not concerned with you. God is still working with you just like God was working with Paul. Don't think that just because you got struggle that you're not gifted. Don't you think that just because you wrestling with some stuff you falling out of God's favor? Don't you think just because you've got some challenges that God is not using you? We all got this thinking backwards. We think thorns mean that we're not worthy. We think thorns mean that we're not deserving. But with the right approach, a thorn means that it keeps us in the proper perspective to understand who we need to trust in and who we need to lean on despite the situation we're in. I stopped by to tell you somebody needs to hear this this morning. You are gifted. You are blessed. God has deposited abilities and gifts and talents in you, and God has not forgotten you. God is using you, and God can use you even with a thorn. 
That's a word for some of you who think that because you got some challenges that you think that God isn't using you or because you struggle with some stuff that God isn't working with you. God can work with you and God can use you no matter what you're dealing with and no matter what you think the obstacle may be. God is able, here it is, God is able to work around what we got to live with. Now, if you don't believe that, then you don't even need to be here. You need to go back to 101. God is able to work around the stuff that we got to deal with. Okay, can I make it live? I was watching uh, Home and Garden Channel um, without my wife the other day. I, I was watching Home and Garden. We, she started me watching Home and Garden Channel, and I criticized her for watching. I say, you always watch this, you always watch it. But the truth is, I've come to like the Home and Garden Channel, and, and I've started watching it sometimes even by myself and I was watching it and flipping channels and I caught one and they were redoing this house. It was one of them redo house things and they brought um, uh, this family that they brought the you know the, the, the remodel people to the house and they said it was uh, they, they were going to do the backyard and they went into the backyard and they said before you go in the backyard you need to know that there's a big challenge and they said well, we used the challenges and in the backyard there was a huge stone in the backyard almost smack in the middle of the backyard. They said, we don't know how it got there. We don't know what they did. But when we bought the house, it was there. Uh, and now that we got a family, we try to do something else. They said, we don't think anybody's going to be able to move this big stone. They said it never did anything to the backyard because of the stone. The designer said, you know what, I ain't worried about it. I can do something with it. And they got to work, and you know how they do. They send them away for a couple of weeks or whatever, and then they come back, and they look at it, and they pull the thing to the side, and everybody act like they ain't seen the house before, and they act all excited or whatever, and they did the house in the makeover. And they said, well, let's go. When they, by the time they go through the rest of the house, they said, let's go to the backyard. And they went to the backyard, and they had the grass. It was all landscaped out. They had this awesome grilling area, and they had built a part around the deck where the stone was connected to the deck and it was in the backyard some kind of unique way and the designer said watch this we had to get creative with the stone because we understood the stone wasn't going nowhere they said because the stone wasn't going nowhere, we had to create a living space around what wouldn't move. And around what wouldn't move, we had to create a space, and we figured we could just build the deck and do something around with it. We weren't going to let it slow us down. Some of y'all missing your shout. We can't look at just the stone, she said. We had to look at the whole backyard. Some of y'all missing your shout. God doesn't just look at the challenge you have. God just doesn't look at the obstacle. God just doesn't concentrate on your thorn. God looks at the whole thing and God knows how to work around it to do more than you ever thought you could. I wonder, is there anybody who can declare, I'm living with some stuff, but I've witnessed God work around it. I'm struggling with some stuff, but I've seen God work around it. And because God can work around it, I'm not going to be limited by the stuff that's going on around. Yeah, he says, he says, you can do this thing just because you got the thorn. You're gifted even though you're working with this thing. You, you're trying to get this turnaround, but it's not about a turnaround. It's about how you function in this thing, which talks about the second thing. Watch this. It is what it is because God will show you what you can't turn around. God will help you tolerate. Oh, okay, come on, come on. What you can't turn around, God can help you tolerate. I know that sounds sticky, but here it is. Paul says, I'm dealing with this thorn, but God's keeping me grounded. There's so much gift in me, I might start to think it's about me and not about Jesus' message. So I got some stuff that keeps me grounded. Let me tell you real fast why this shouts me. Paul uses the word skolos. He uses the word skolos, the Greek word for thorn. It is not thorn as in sticker bush. It's a word like a pike. It's a word like a stick, like a stick that's sharpened, like a piece of wood that's carved into a point. And what you would do with this skolos is what you would do is dig a hole. You dig a hole and then you take a whole bunch of these pikes and you stick them in the ground upward. And then you'd cover the hole in the hopes that something would walk onto it, fall, and then impale themselves on the pikes. Jeez. Right? So in other words, the thorn that he's using isn't thorn as in sticker bush. The thorn he's using is thorn as in trap. He's saying, I'm being, uh, there is traps being placed in front of me. He said, I'm trying to exist in this thing, but the devil is putting traps 
in front of me. Oh, that's, oh, that ought to get somebody in here. The thorn isn't just like a nuisance. The thorn is the equivalent to a trap. Paul says to keep me from being conceited, the messenger of Satan plants traps for me. This kind of thorn just doesn't affect my body if it gets me, but it also worries my mind. The reason why it worries my mind is because I got to be careful of where I step. I got to be careful of where I go. I got to be careful of who to trust. I got to be careful of what I say. I got to be careful of every move I make. And when I do that all the time, my mind gets tired because I'm trying to avoid the trap that other people are setting for me. I wonder if there's some people who can say at the end of the week, I am exhausted, not just in my body, but I'm exhausted in my mind because I'm I'm trying to be careful about where you leading me. I'm trying to be careful about what you say. I'm trying to be careful about your arm around me. I'm trying to be careful about helping me out. I'm trying to figure it out because I know that Satan got some traps that he's trying to set for me. Doing all of that watching, doing all of that second guessing, doing all of that preparing, doing all of that careful watching where I step, doing all of that measuring twice and cutting once. That stuff can affect your mind. Now watch this. Paul is clear that it's Satan. He's clear that it's Satan. The enemy who was out to get him. So he's not saying, watch this, he's not saying God gave me the thorn. Don't miss this. Because too many times what happens is we find ourselves in tricky situations and we say, God, why did you do this to me? Or why did you do this to us? God, why can't I get out of this place? God, why don't you take me out of this situation? God, can't you just get them out of my life? God, why do I have to deal with these people? God, this ain't fair. Why can't you sit and do something about this? Hear me. God doesn't cause the situation. God is in the situation. Somebody else need to hear that. Y'all need to hear this. God doesn't cause all things. God walks in all things. It's different. There's a difference. There's a difference. This is important to remember when something is what it is. Because what we do is we start to wonder what God can't do. But God is still working. Sometimes the issue isn't about getting out, but making sure that what, what doesn't get in. Did I go too fast? I'm going to say it again. God says it's not the situation you're in that's the biggest issue. Your biggest issue is making sure what you're in doesn't get in you. The biggest issue, God's presence says I'm here to make sure that what you're in doesn't get in you. Paul says three times. I asked God to get this out, get, get, get me out of this. I asked God to remove it, and God didn't, right? So some of us would say, so that by, by that reasoning, God must not be able to, or that God is so mean, or he's, God is such a bully that God wants me to suffer. But God says, with some things, it just is what it is. But it doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that you're not good enough. It doesn't mean that you're not worthy or you're not good. It means that God can work with you despite the situation. Now, full disclaimer, full disclaimer. I'm not telling anybody to stay in a miserable or dangerous situation that's harmful for you physically, emotionally, or mental. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. God isn't telling you to stay somewhere that is not healthy for you. God is saying regardless of the situation of what is the best you that you can be while you are there, don't let the situation get in you. I'm wanting the best to come out of you despite the situation you're in. That becomes the real lesson. How not to let what you, where you are get into you. Toxic people around you, but don't let toxic people get into you. Dysfunctional people will come around. But don't you let dysfunctional people get into you. Some system, some organization you deal with that is full of mess and doesn't want to be efficient, doesn't want to be productive. Don't you let those systems and organizations get into you. Some people in your life don't want you to have anything or amount to much or leave them behind. So they'll tell you that what you can't do or what you aren't smart enough to do. Don't let those people's thinking get into you. Some people are too insecure to watch you develop, to 
watch you grow. They're afraid of growing themselves, so they want you to stay as unproductive as they are in some unproductive places. Don't let their attitudes get in to you. We can be in a lot of situations, but don't let what you're in get in to you. Look what he says. Look what he says. Paul says, God tells them, when you ask to remove the stone three times, so you know I'm serious. I asked God three times, so God, you know I'm serious. God says, my grace <laughs> is sufficient. Hold on. I, I know you want to shout. Don't do it yet. Wait a minute. Let me, let me set it up. I know you want to go fast because here's why. We like to run to the word grace. We like to run to the word grace, but we don't pay attention to the word sufficient. We don't understand what it means that God's grace is sufficient. God says my grace is sufficient. The word literally means what I'm giving you <laughs> is enough. <laughs> he says, I know you might feel unhappy, but God says what I'm giving you is enough. That's Now that's the part that shall worthy because God is saying wherever you are, whatever you're doing, however you find yourself, what I'm about to give you is enough. However you feel it, however you operate, whatever you think they trying to do, what I'm about to give you is enough. God's movement is not about giving us what we want. God's movement is about giving us what's best. See, watch this. God tells Paul, I'm giving you my best. This is what God tells Paul. I'm giving you my best even when your struggle is real. You see, sometimes we get so caught up in the idea of what is happening or where we are is not what we want. We start to focus on that. We start to question if we could even make it. But God is not helping us make it on what we want. God is helping us make it on what God has given. That's why it's called grace. Because if we just want to uh, just up to us, we wouldn't make it at all. If it was just up to our ability, we wouldn't make it at all. I need to say it again. If it was just less up to us, we would not have made it at all but God is giving us the grace that propels us to what we cannot do for ourselves God says what I give is enough you can make it based upon what I give you so it's not about so much where you are it's about the perspective that you are working with if you are working with the right perspective then you could put it all I can make it and understand God's given me enough to get through this thing God says you can tolerate what's happening because of what I'm giving you. Sometimes the answer is not in what you don't have. Sometimes the answer is in what you have. Sometimes the renewal is not in what you lack, but it's what you bring to the table. Sometimes the power is not in where you are or what's, where you're, what you're in, but what's in you. God says you're working with my grace and my grace is enough. My grace is enough to handle it. My grace is enough to make you strong. My grace is enough to pull you through that's why you're still moving that's why you're still here because you're working with my grace that's why you haven't fallen apart because you're working with my grace that's why you can still work like you got some hope because you're working with my grace that's why what others say about you doesn't stick with you long because you're working with my grace that's why you can walk into a room full of people who don't like you a little bit and wave at everybody and tell them how you're doing because you said I'm working with the Lord's grace that when you get up and get on your grind each day you're working with my grace that's why you got a little bit more in your tank because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me I can't help but say I'm thankful that I'm working with his grace can I get a few of y'all in here just to celebrate the grace that's been given to you. It might not be perfect. I'm thanks for grace and I'm thanks for grace. It might not be what I want, but I'm giving them thanks for grace. I might be exhausted, but I'm giving them thanks for grace because everything that God gives me is enough. It's enough. It's enough. He says, it's enough. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. It's enough. <laughs> My grace is enough. 
That's what he says. That's what he says. God's blessed you with enough that you can hold on a little while longer. But here's the other thing. Here's the other thing, and I'm done. Here's the other thing. I'm finished. Listen, get y'all out of here. Somebody got a barbecue to go to. Here it goes. So listen, it is, it is what it is uh, because we want to transform, right? We want to turn around. We want the quick turnaround. And it is what it is because even what we can't turn around, God can help us tolerate. But the third thing is, it is what it is because God will place us with the tenacity to endure. Here it is. Paul says, I don't do this on my own, right? I'm working with God's grace. That's the awakening for Paul. That's the awakening. God says, see, the first mistake you make is to think that you're doing this all by yourself. You think it's the situation were better. If the thorn was removed, you would be fine. But the truth is, it's not your, uh, just your ability that's helping you do this. The healing ability, the visions, the preaching, the teaching, that's not just you. That's grace pushing you through. See, we have a successful moment. We have a high moment. And then folks look at us and celebrate our high moment. And then we think we did it. Right? But if you don't have sense enough to say, to God be the glory. That somewhere along your accomplishment, somewhere along your celebration, it ought to be to God, be the glory. Because you're going to mess around and think that you did it all by yourself, but when you fall, it ain't yourself you call. When you stumble, it ain't yourself you call. When it's yourself, I, I've heard you, I've heard you. When you, you say, Lord, I need this, Lord, help me, son. God, I need you to show up in this thing. I need y'all to be honest with me. Don't act like, you know, just because y'all, uh, you know, y'all got a little bit of success, y'all think y'all did it. I need some people to be honest with me and say, I didn't do this thing by myself. I didn't make it by myself. There's grace <laughs> pushing me through this thing. The healing ability, the visions. The preaching, the teaching, you ain't do that all by yourself. You gifted, yeah. But the gift came from somewhere. The gift had some help. Here it is. Don't confuse your success with your ability. You have ability, but God's grace is working with your success. God's presence is enough to get you through the places where the enemy thorns are around you. But then God says, but then, but then God says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, when my power, God says, when my power is revealed, it's when your power runs out. <laughs> my power shows up and kicks in when your limits reveal themselves. When your limits reveal themselves, that's when my limitlessness kicks in. See, when we look like we can't anymore, God's power reveals itself. When, we, when we're limited, God's limitless power comes forward. When we run out, God is just getting started. And let me say this. Could I just say this to you? God ain't upset with you when you run out. Somebody needs to hear that. God is not upset with you when you run out. If God is the creator of all things, God knows, guess what? You're going to run out. God knows you're going to run out. God already knows that you have limits. God already knows that we are finite. God already knows that we don't have the capacity to run endlessly. Side note, I don't care what anybody says. Naomi Osaka, that's my girl. <laughs> That's my girl. Y'all don't know Naomi Osaka. Naomi Osaka only happens to be the number one ranked tennis player in the world at 23 years old. And she had the good sense to back out of the French Open because she said, this thing is messing with my mental health. All these reporters, all this atmosphere, she understood her limits. And the media tried to vilify her or shame her because she took a rest. I saw that. I said, girl, take all the rest you need. Keep on resting. Know your limits. Know what increases your stress level. Know Know what wears you out. Know what raises your anxiety. And take care of yourself. Because here's the thing. You keep running, 
And then you go crazy, you end up not able to play, you end up doing drugs, you end up on the street, and all people going to do is do an expose and talk, what a shame, what happened to Naomi Osaka, what a problem, she couldn't handle it. No, you are handling it, boo, you handle it the way you need to handle it, do what you need to do, them other folk that's making money off you, they can wait, you take care of yourself. God's not bent out of shape. When you understand your limits. God's not mad at us when God understands our limits. God knows we're limited. People will assess your situation and think they know what's best for you. But don't feel bad when you feel close to your limit. Because we think that we are endless on energy, but God already knows how we get exhausted. God doesn't get upset about our limits. God already knows our limits and what we can and can't handle. God says, but when you get weak, <laughs> I start to show my strength. When you get weak, that's when I start to show up. People might look at you, but they know that there's something else working with you in the moment. Uh, yeah, they might see how exhausted you are, but when they see everything come to a conclusion, they have to know that it wasn't you, that it was something else working in you. People may see you and will know that there's something else pushing you. Look, Paul says, that's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardship and in persecution and in difficulty. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He said, when I'm weak, I actually get stronger. God gives me me that extra that allows me to finish. Paul says in those situations when I look weak, God shows up and people see the God in me. When I look like I can't and I pull it through, people know that it's the power of the Lord working through me. I will look like I can't, but when it all starts to come together, God's strength is working with me. I might look like I don't know how, but when it all works out, God's strength is still working with me. I might not have the ability to endure Endure and I look like I'm stumbling but when I make it to the end God's strength is still working with me. I might look like it's over. I might look like you have me beat but when I make it to the finish line God's strength is still working with me. God says the grace that I'm giving you is still enough. I can see you through even when it seems like the situation won't change. In fact the situation is changing because even if the situation isn't changing I'm doing enough with you to change you in the situation. And no matter what's around you, I'm still working through you so that you might get the victory. God says you might still have to work at it, but I'm right here with you. You might have to work and push sometimes, but I'm still right with you. You might have to climb and crawl sometimes, but I'm still right here with you. You might have to stumble and weep sometimes, but I'm still right here with you. Can I get a few of y'all in here just to say I know what it is to stumble, but I also know what it is to have God at my back. I know what it is to be talked about, but I also know what it is to have God pulling me. I know what it is to be exhausted and my legs worn out, but the hand of God just keep pulling me and talking about, come on child, you ain't finished yet. I still got work to do and I'm still pushing harder yet might be the fight right may often yield to might wickedness a while may reign and they may scorn you by your name but there is a God who rules above with a hand of mercy and a heart of love and if I'm right I'm told he'll fight my battles and I shall have peace someday. Here it is. 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 So, another day, watching TV, right? Watching TV the other day, and I got a thing for the animal planet. Me and Medea's brother, Joe, we got a thing for the animal planet channel. Got a thing for the animal planet channel. And I'm watching Animal Planet, and they're doing this thing on cheetahs. I like animals. I like, you know, cats. I like big cats. They fascinate me. Right? And so I'm watching this thing on cheetahs. Cheetahs are the fastest mammals on the earth. They're fast. They can fast. They can go from zero to 60 in something like four point something seconds. They're crazy fast. Watch this. When they're born, they're vulnerable. 
They don't start, they're not born fast. They got to grow before they can get to their great. Some of y'all just missed that. You don't start off with the ability. You got to grow into the ability. They wasn't born fast. They had to grow into their speed. But while they're cubs, they're quite vulnerable by other predators around. And there were predators, jaguars, hyenas, stuff like that would come at them. And um, this hyena saw these two cubs. This hyena saw these two cubs. The hyena was by himself, and the hyena was trying to get at the cubs. And the mother happened to find them just in time. And the mother did something on the video that caused me to shout. The mother cheetah pulled the cubs close to her with one paw. And when the hyena would get close enough, she would swipe with the other paw. She pulled, if they, if she would pull with one, and then the cubs, you know, being kids, they trying to get from around the mother's a paw. So the mother would have to pull them in again and swipe with the other one. Right? And she would hit him in the hyena in the face, which would scratch him up and call him to draw back. But the whole time, she made sure that she was pulling the cub close and swiping the hyena. She, she kept pulling the cub close, but then swiping the hyena. And after a while, the hyena realized that it didn't need to get scratched to death. He realized that this wasn't a meal for him and walked off. But I got to thinking, and I was in my bedroom, and I had no other choice but to lay, raise my hand. And I said, ain't that just how the grace of God operates? That sometimes it's not about removing the hyena. Sometimes it's not about taking away the thorn. But God is able to keep you close and keep just far away what might destroy you. God's that kind of protector that is able to keep you close but also keep the danger away from you. It's not that he removes the danger altogether but God does just enough to make sure that you stay close and that the danger stays away. Aren't you glad that the storm didn't destroy you? Aren't you glad that there some thorns in your life uh, that you might be dealing with uh, but they haven't gotten the best of you uh, aren't you grateful uh, that some of the thorns you're dealing with uh, have not caused you to quit uh, that God's been able uh, to hold you close uh, and at the same time uh, say they don't do harm uh, to any of my children uh, that God is able uh, to pull you close uh, and keep the enemy at bay uh, that God is able uh, to pull you close and say you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God, not the tail. To pull you close and declare you are the head and not the tail. God is able to pull you close and say weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God is able to pull you close and say touch not my anointed. God God is able to pull you close and declare that you can do all things that God ain't finished that you even may endure for a night that you've got strength that you can do all things that God is continuing to put you together despite the thorn despite the enemy despite the challenge you're still safe in his arms can anybody get glad that I I'm safe in his arms, that I'm safe in his arms, that I'm safe. I wish, I wish I could tell you that everything was going to work out the way you wanted it to. I wish I could, but some stuff just is what it is. But God is still open. And God says, what I'm giving you is enough for you to make it in your situation. I don't, I don't doubt, don't get me wrong, I don't doubt that thorns can shift. I don't doubt thorns can change. I don't doubt that obstacles can get moved out of our lives. 
But until it does, God says, everything I'm giving you is enough. You are still gifted. You still have ability. God has not forsaken you. Yeah, you've got challenges. Join the club. Everybody in here got a challenge. You know, and sometimes the biggest challenge is, is working hard to prove, to show to other people they don't have no challenge. But the challenge is regardless of what challenges you face, you need to know that you are still gifted enough that God is pouring into you each and every day. And God says, the gift that I'm giving you, the grace that I'm giving you is enough for you to get where you need to go. So listen, what I want you to do, I want you to just stand to your feet, if you will. Just stand to your feet. You don't have to move. You don't have to move. Just stand where you are. Stand where you are. And God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your grace being enough. We thank you, God, for being sufficient. We thank you, God, for your presence and your power keeping us in this moment. And God, in those places that we might be struggling, that I'm praying right now, I'm praying for everybody here in the sanctuary. I'm praying for everybody on social media, our friends who are watching and sharing, members of New Calvary. I'm praying, God, that whatever challenges they have right now, whatever it is they're facing, whatever it is they're going through, whatever it is they're dealing with, God, that you would give them the strength to trust in you and to be reminded that they aren't deficient because they are struggling. But they are just as gifted. They are just as talented. They are just as blessed. But some of them are tired. Some of us are exhausted. Some of us are weary. We're worn out with what we're dealing with. We're, we're, we're exhausted from looking for the traps. Traps, COVID-19, traps at our job, traps in our home, traps of institutional racism, traps of structural powerlessness, the traps of privilege, microaggressions. We are tired, God. Some of us are exhausted, and we need your help. But we're doing the best we can. And we need you to know that, God, we, we're being totally transparent with you right now that we're facing our places of exhaustion. We're at our places of limit. We're at our places of running out of energy and strength. So God, help us to renew our strength. Help us right now. I pray for everyone who is watching and witnessing right now that you would just help us to be revived. Help us to be revived. But most of all, in those places where we are weak, God, we make us strong. Let your spirit fall, fall fresh upon us, that we would be strong, and that in all things we give you glory, honor, and praise. So right now, right now, as we go forward, as we continue to share of the Lord, come on, put your amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Come on, put your hands together. Give God glory. Listen going to prepare for ordinance of Holy Communion right now. Maybe somebody who wants to be a part of the New Calvary family, maybe somebody uh, in your spirit, you want to be a part of New Calvary, we extend this invitation. Just raise your hand. You don't have to come down, come forth and all that. Just raise your hand. And we'd love to share with you. We'd love to be a church family. I'd love to be a pastor. You can call that number, 757-828-6121. Be a part, call. Somebody will answer. Somebody will want to be, somebody will answer you. Or you get on email, newcav, N-E-W-C-A-V-1 at verizon.net. Be a part of this thing. We believe that God is still moving. 